Hello and welcome to REFM's Real Estate Finance and Investments in 80 Minutes. This is Bruce Kirsch, founder of REFM. If you have not done so already and are interested, you can find the slides for this content in the Materials tab of the lesson page. Let's go ahead now and get started by taking a look at our agenda. First, what we'll do is take a detailed look at debt financing. Then we will examine the cash flow setup for an income producing property. We'll talk about investment returns metrics and how to calculate them. And we'll take a deeper look at the DCF model. And we'll do all of this by using an illustrative case study. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of an equity investor in commercial real estate. And let's say that we want to acquire this property, the Bayview Apartments complex, for $100 million. Equity investors will generally capitalize a transaction with both equity and debt capital, and those sources of funds come together to provide for the uses of funds, which are the purchase price and the transaction costs. The senior debt is secured by the property and of equal importance, the cash flows that are tied to the property. And a lien is placed on the property by the senior lender, which is an example of an encumbrance on the title of the property. And a minority coming from mortgage REITs, other players, and pension and retirement funds. All of these lending parties look at things slightly differently and underwrite or assess opportunities somewhat differently. Let's take a look at banks versus insurance companies versus securitized lenders. And these are all long-term commercial real estate lenders, so we're ignoring the idea of construction loans. Let's take a look at banks first. The primary focus when underwriting for banks is the borrower's credit or how likely they are to be able to service debt and repay principal. The amount of leverage that they will use is moderate, meaning anywhere between 50% LTV to 70, let's say. And that's going to change based off of how hot the capital markets are and how aggressively lenders are competing to deploy capital. So the lender is going to come up with some dollar amount. But the question becomes, if we're the borrower, should we just simply borrow that amount that is being offered? And in some cases, the answer is yes. But more holistically, how much one should borrow depends on qualitative factors beyond quantitative factors. Some of those other factors are your tax profile. You may not have a need for shielding of income taxes because you're nonprofit in nature. Naturally, your capital needs will play a large role, but there's also the idea of your risk tolerance. The more you borrow, the more you have to pay back. What other liabilities might you have on your balance sheet? We need to keep in mind that while we would like to think that property values are always going to go up over time in a nice, smooth, predictable manner. That's just not true. It's not the case. So when we take a look at how this $100 million acquisition could potentially decrease in value by the end of year two to $90 million, let's say there's a weak economy, there's loss of tenants, there's bankrupt tenants who are taking up space but not paying rent, we have a building that's worth 10% less. So we have this lost value. Now, let's take a look at how that plays out. First, let's focus in on structure number one. It rises in each successive month. And in a corresponding manner, because the overall payment is constant, the portion of the payment that is interest is declining in each successive month. The net of the amortization or repayment of the principal on that monthly 
periodic basis is that in each successive month, the loan balance, collectively these are known as capital items, sometimes they're simply called reserves and capex. And every property is always deteriorating. It's always falling apart. So reserves are put away, usually on a monthly basis, to fund the inevitable cash expenditures related to the physical deterioration of the property, the 100 minus the 80. Now we can take that 20 million on a tax deferred basis and now go out and buy property B and property C. And this is one of the oldest plays in the book in terms of how people will build a real estate portfolio. Now just because we take this money and spend it as equity over here doesn't mean that we no longer owe it as debt over here on property A. And the market is hot for this type of property. And brokers are calling us, asking us what our plans are, and we have some potential buyers, and we entertain the idea of selling the property. Well, now the question becomes, at what price should we sell? We don't have control over that. Naturally, we're a price taker, not a price maker. So if we're going to go through this process, we would likely hire an investment sales broker. After having them compete, we would award the listing to an investment sales group, and they would run a competitive bidding process. And then we held one, two, three. We did our refi here at a value of 125 million. And then we held for two more years. And let's say they're gonna offer us 130 million. And they're offering that 130 million based off of a set of assumptions for what the adjusted NOI is gonna be going forward, based off of what they think is a good yield on the purchase price, which is the adjusted NOI divided by that purchase price. And this type of incentive structure is quite common, and it's put in place to allow the third-party investor who has the majority of the equity at risk to have confidence that the pilot of their plane, so to speak, is paying attention and trying their very hardest to have a successful transaction over a very long and potentially arduous journey.